I'm going to be telling you about machines that learn from data. Um, and the first speaker gave a very related talk, which is humans that learn from data. And actually, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how we can take how humans learn and translate that into machines that can learn from data. <clears throat> um, some of you know me, and I'm a theory guy. That means math. But don't worry. Um, we're, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, I'm, I'm just going to try to convince you that this is a non-trivial task, but it's a very important task. And we're going to begin with a little bit of show and tell. So this little collage here somewhat represents the world today. Um, and I'll briefly describe some of these things. Um, and if you think about the world, let's say, 50 years ago, you'd think you were living on a different planet. Um, and perhaps 10 years from now, we'll be on a different planet yet. Um, so what's going on here? So these are all examples where we have, in some sense, succeeded at learning from data. And, and they're actually machines that are learning from data. So on top there is what happens when I log into Netflix. Okay. Um, and you, know, you, you might initially get surprised. But if you put your learning from data hats on, you'll be able to figure out what's going on. And I'll tell you what's going on. Netflix has somehow figured out that I have a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Okay. And this, these are the recommendations to me. And somehow, you know, even though I'm the one registered, I'm the one whose credit card they have, I'm the one whose email address they have, these are my recommendations. <laughs> Okay, so you know who watches TV in our house. Um, this is Google over here. Now, it's, I guess the, it's, it's not easy to see, but um, the search, it's a, it's a result from a search that I did some time ago. I was uh, about to take a hot shower. There was no hot water. So I went down into the basement. I see that the hot water heater is not working. Actually, the hot water heater is working. The pilot lamp is not working. Anyone here know what a pilot lamp is? You're all students. Well, if you're, if you're not students and you have a hot water heater in your apartment, you know what a pilot lamp is. So I googled pilot lamp, uh, 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 relight pilot lamp furnace. That that those were the actual search terms. OK, so this is interesting. Google you know, first hit how to relight your pilot lamp in a gas furnace and dot, dot, dot. But what's interesting is on the right here, OK, and the first, does this thing have a pointer? Ah, yes. Anyone see the pointer? <laughs> OK, so I'm pointing to this, uh, this line here. That line says, Chris are fully brothers heating. OK. Now, that line here, Chris Fully Brothers Heating, is, you know, is, is, is the company that currently fixes our heater. So we have a contract with them, a yearly contract. This is a Google ad. Um, somehow they have learned from data. Okay, it's not that Chris Fully Brothers Heating has placed a specific ad that says whenever someone searches for relight pilot lamp on furnace, um, you should display my ad. No. Google has an incentive to keep its advertisers happy, and somehow it needs to figure out which search queries it should place various ads on, and it decided that, hey, this, here's, a, here's a sucker. He's looking to relight his uh, pilot lamp on his uh, heater. Let's show him an ad for the local you know, heat furnace maintenance agency. Um, this is another example here. This is what happens when I log into Amazon. Now, actually, Amazon has made a mistake because they're focusing too much on my recent purchases. And I recently purchased Grumpy Cat, some kind of Grumpy Cat book. Anyone here know what Grumpy Cat is? <laughs> OK. I purchased that for my two-year-old or my four-year-old or something like that. And then here I have, I purchased Math Practice 5. So you know that my five-year-old, my eight-year-old is having some problems in school. So Google, um, Amazon knows all this, but it's actually making a mistake, because this is not in the norm 
for my purchases. Most of my purchases would have something to do with machine learning or, or interesting books or stuff like that. So they're focusing too much on recent history. So something, so it's a non-trivial task, but it's everywhere today. Okay? Now, it's not just limited to e-commerce. Today, the, the postal system doesn't, doesn't really hire workers to uh, shift mail around. We automatically recognize digits and send it to the right zip code. And we do it pretty much all the time correctly. So, so we, we have systems that have learned from data and are able to, to recognize digits almost as well as humans. Not quite as well, but almost as well. <clears throat> okay. At one point, around 10, 15 years ago, the world's best backgammon player. Now, I don't play backgammon, but I can appreciate that it's a very hard game. The world's best backgammon player was a, was a machine that learned from data. And even today, it's one of the best. Same thing with the chess. Chess is played almost at the highest level by machines. <clears throat> um, we have machines that can, from aerial images, which are very high resolution, and having learned from data, they can classify plant species that they observe on the ground. Well, why do we care about that? It turns out that if you can count very accurately the number of species of particular plants and particular animals, then you can figure out what's going on in the environment, what's going on in the ecology. Okay? And lots of things are going on in the environment, especially in the icy environments, in the tropical environments. Things are disappearing at unusual rates. We need to be able to count very, and we have to count very accurately. <clears throat> um, you know, this is, this is an example of a, a cancer slide, okay? And to a human eye, you can easily see here are cancerous cells, here are, you know, non-cancerous cells. Can we train machines to diagnose these things quickly and perhaps earlier? Same thing with heart disease and access control, face recognition. So, so that's the world today. We have systems that have, or machines that have learned from data, okay, and can perform all these sophisticated tasks. Soon, 10 years from now, where are we going? We're going towards this thing called the Internet of Things. Anyone heard of this? The IOT, the Internet of Things. That's where we're going. We won't have control anymore. Machines which have learned from data will learn what our preferences are, what do we want, what do we need. We'll have the smart fridge, and it'll automatically communicate that, hey, I've noticed that this guy likes to eat pasta on Fridays. We're low on pasta. Boom, goes to Amazon, orders pasta Thursday. The pasta is delivered at the door. All you need is the robot that will take the pasta and put it in the fridge or with the sauce. I, I guess we don't put pasta in the fridge, but let's say the sauce. <laughs> Okay, um, robotics, much harder task, it turns out. Okay, so we don't quite have the robot that could easily perform that task, but everything else that could link up this internet of things and analyze and learn from the data is within the next decade. It's plausible. <clears throat> okay. So you, you, you can see the amazing diversity of things that we can um, create machines to solve but I'll tell you one thing. We didn't create these machines by figuring out ourselves how to solve the problem. So we didn't create a mathematical model of cancer cells and then program that into the computer. That's not how we solve these problems. Okay? And what I'm going to tell you about today is a little bit about how we actually solve this problem. We don't know mathematically what's the correct shape of a cancer cell versus a non-cancer cell, and what's the correct color, and what's the mathematical relationship between density and this and that. I am not an expert in any of those fields, yet I feel confident that I could ad address this problem if you give me data. That's, that's what this field of learning from data is about. Okay. And um, just to get our feet wet, let's try to solve a problem like this in some sense from first principles by defining, let's say, what is a cancer cell, programming in it in some big 50,000 line piece of software and seeing if a machine could go and do that. So let's try to do that with a much simpler problem, a tree. Okay. So suppose we sit down. Okay, now I'm a 40-year-old. You guys are all... 20-year-olds, and so on, we're all, we, we consider ourselves intelligent. 
Right? We all go to RPI or something like that, or we belong to the RPI community. So we consider ourselves intelligent. Let us try to define a tree. So what do I mean by define a tree? Write down such a precise definition that we could then go and sit down in front of a computer and write a program, and then it'll go and find all the trees out there. Okay? So how would such a definition start? Well, you know, the moment you sit down to try to give a very precise and complete definition of a tree, you will immediately realize how hard that is. You might start something, well, it's a brown trunk moving upwards, there are branches, there are leaves, and so on and so forth. Okay, but then you start thinking about boundary cases that you may have left out. For example, is that thing on top a tree? Well, it's clearly a tree. Okay, but now this is not just a, a, a trunk that moves upwards. Well, what if you get to see the roots? Okay, and is this thing a tree? Who says yes? Anybody? Some of you say yes. Who says no? Okay, but here's the interesting thing. When I do a Google search under images for tree, this is one of the top hits. Okay, so it's a hard problem to define a tree. Actually, this is some kind of a fake tree that we build to kind of con cats into thinking it's a tree so that they go and scratch. I guarantee you the cats are not conned, <laughs> okay? And here's why I know it. Because even though we can spend a lot of time trying to define precisely a tree, you know, and as some judge once said some time ago, I don't know how to define it, but I know what it is when I see it. It was in a different context, <laughs> but um, we don't know how to define a tree, but we know what it is when we see it. Because, look, if I ask any of you, pick out all the pictures with trees, and I can take you back 17 years to when you were three years old, you won't have any difficulty. Okay. This, this, uh, this is a tree, okay, that's a tree, and it doesn't matter, it's a cartoon of a tree, no problem for you, that's a tree. I rotated a little, no problem. That thing is, that picture contains a tree, but it's not nice and black and white, or it's not with normal colors, it's in some bizarre lighting, no problem, okay? And probably, has anyone seen this? Anybody know what that is? It's a tree, <laughs> okay? But it's a very peculiar tree, it's called a baobab tree, okay? It was common where I grew up, but you don't find it in the US, okay? But still, we won't have any problem picking it out as a tree, okay? So you can ask yourself the following question, why is it that we have absolutely no problem picking out a tree, and we can do this not just with these eight images, but with 10,000 images, we won't make a mistake. Why is it that we have no problems picking out all the trees, but we cannot write down a precise definition of a tree? Okay. That is the fundamental dilemma that we face when we try to develop machines that could actually pretend to be humans. And the reason we have no problem here is because we never learned how to figure out what trees are by your mother or your father telling you, here's the precise definition of a tree. Nobody told you a tree has a, has a trunk with branches and so on and so forth. You were just shown data. You were shown pictures, you have a history, you have a, a, a childhood and, a, and an upbringing and whatnot where you, were, where you observed all kinds of things. Some of them were trees, some of them were not trees, cars, cats, and so on and so forth, and you learned from that data, even though you cannot precisely define a tree. So what I want to show you, so that's the task that we are trying to emulate with machines. Can we learn from data? Okay. And now you're sitting in the audience saying, it's easy. I had absolutely no problem picking out all the trees. So it's such an easy task, even a three-year-old can pick out all the trees, okay? Actually, it's not easy. It's just that you're familiar with this task. You've had a long time to work on this task. So in order to show you that this is not an easy task, I'm gonna ask you to put on your so-called machine learning hats, and I'm gonna give you a problem. You are going to sit here in the audience and try to figure out or try to learn what is a tree and what is not a tree. Actually, trees from dogs. But the problem, the challenge I face 
is that I have to somehow equalize everyone and, in fact, re re remove all the history, all your 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, whatever it is, of history on trees and dogs and all your experience. And I want to put you in a situation where a machine would find itself, because a machine starts from zero. It's just a circuit board or an operating system. Okay. So here, you guys get to behave like machines for one slide. Okay. On top is what we call data. Okay. And this is the typical way in which data is presented to you. I'm showing you some pictures of dogs. Everything on the top row are dogs. Okay, so those are not dogs. Those don't look like dogs. That's precisely the case. <laughs> You're not, I'm not, they're not what you think are dogs. You're supposed to learn what is a dog. Okay. So I'm telling you, everything on the top is a dog. Everything on the bottom row is a tree. That's your data. Okay. So just look at it for about 15 seconds or so. However long you think you need. And some of you have seen this before if you have play along. Okay. Just try to figure out what is it that makes a dog a dog and what is it that makes a tree a tree. Okay. 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 I hope you have sp spent this time wisely because now comes the test. The guy on the bottom. Is it a dog or is it a tree? And if you appreciate this task, and if you appreciate how hard this task is, you're already 90% of the way there. Okay. That is the task that we face when we try to take a machine from zero, show it some data, let's say of pictures with trees and pictures without trees, and then later on we deploy it in the real world and show it some random picture and ask it, is there or is there not a tree? Well, tree is just, an, is, is just a placeholder. Is it or is it not a cancerous cell? Should I or should I not ad advertise Chris Fully Brothers to this guy? Okay. Is this a digit? Is this digit seven or not? They're all the same problem. If we can solve this problem, we can solve all these problems. Okay. So, who says the bottom is a tree? Okay. Who says it's a dog? Okay. So I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> but what I am going to tell you is that we have just uncovered, we have just unearthed a very serious problem, which is what? The best learning machines in the world, because we're at RPI, <laughs> and we're humans. The best learning machines in the world cannot agree on this simple problem. In fact, half of you say it's a dog, and half of you say it's a tree. Okay. What's going on? Okay. This is a simple problem, ladies and gentlemen. Why are half of you saying it's a dog? Well, the half of you who are saying it's a dog are actually probably, you know, doing something very smart and very complex. Oh, no, it's the guys who are saying it's trees <laughs> who are doing something very complex and very, very subtle. Okay, what's that? You've probably noticed that the trees somehow capture some complex notion of symmetry. There's something like symmetry going on. Okay, you know, and, 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 and like that judge, it's hard to define symmetry, but we sort of know it when we see it. Okay, and somehow everything on the bottom seems to be symmetric. Okay, and this thing here also seems to display some kind of symmetry. So we, we are applying actually the simplest machine learning algorithm we know, compare with the data, and base your decision on the data. So the data points that are symmetric are trees. This thing is symmetric. It's a tree. Okay. 
Very sophisticated though. It's a very sophisticated approach because we, in our mind, have some mental image of symmetry. But let me show you something much simpler. Top left pixel. If the top left pixel is white, it's a tree. If the top left pixel is black, it's a dog. The thing on the bottom has the top left pixel black, so it's a dog. So it could be a dog or it could be a tree. <laughs> Depends on whether you say symmetry or whether you honed in on top left pixel. Okay. Now, I'm a theorist, and like I say, in the back of, in my office, when I'm sitting behind my desk, it's all about math and this and that. But this is the essence of the problem. Okay. How is it that the, the sleekest learning machines on Earth are not able to solve this small problem, and we're trying to solve cancer? Okay. We cannot solve this small problem. Okay. So, it turns out that we have to spend a lot of time mathematically, theoretically, breaking down just this issue. Okay. And, and ultimately what it boils down to, okay, and what makes this problem easy to us, and what makes this problem familiar to us, and what makes us not make any errors here, there are two things that it boils down to. The first thing is that we are we are sort of very, very, very mature. Even the three-year-old is very, very mature. So they have three years of experience. So they have seen lots of data. Okay. That's point number one. Point number two is that we are actually not good at learning anything. Okay. We have a very fine-tuned machine. We are primed for certain types of learning tasks. And in particular, this is one of them. We're very good at it, we have a lot of experience, and we perform it perfectly. Actually, we are very good at this task, okay? But we don't have enough data, and we're not quite fine-tuned to sort of, to, to perform learning in a, in a somewhat random situation, okay? So, here's what the theory of machine learning can tell us just from these few examples. Okay. And there's an ancient P Persian saying that mimics it a lot. I don't, I don't know if probably, you know, in, in today's cyber age, we don't, we're not familiar with ancient Persian sayings. Okay, but there is a saying which goes, he who knows and knows it is wise. Okay, follow. He who knows and knows not is asleep. Wake. He who, knows, he who knows not and knows it is a student, teach. That's like the machine. Okay. It has the potential to know but does not know exactly how to do things. We'll teach him. But he who knows not and knows not that he knows not, very dangerous. Okay. Avoid. Okay. The theory of learning actually uncovers something very similar. If you correctly prime your machine learner, so, so, so if you correctly prime it, just like our brains are somewhat correctly primed, okay, if you correctly prime your machine learner, you will not be able to learn everything. Okay? And so what that means is that for a particular task, you have to prime your machine in a particular way. But what you will be able to deduce if you correctly prime your learning system is if your machine has learned, you will know it. Okay. And then you've solved the problem. If your machine has learned, you will know it. It's a good machine. You can use it for prediction. You can deploy it. Okay. If your machine has not learned, you will know it if it's correctly primed, okay? And that's sort of similar to this situation where, you know, here we can ask ourselves and say, you know, um, well, there are multiple explanations of this data. Top left pixel, symmetry. We have a problem, okay? And we can sort of diagnose that there could be a problem. Similar here, the, the theory of machine learning says that there are good machines which know when they have learned, 
and know when they have not learned. When they have not learned, you've identified the limitation. When they have learned, you have succeeded. Okay? There are bad machines. Okay? And this is what we spend all our time trying to figure out mathematically how to avoid bad machines. Bad machines are machines that may learn, but you won't know it. They won't know they have learned. Or worse, they may not, they may, they may not learn, and they will not know that they have not learned. So they will think they have learned. Those are dangerous. Okay, you can imagine deploying a system that claims to diagnose cancer from non-cancer. So it's claiming to diagnose it, so it thinks it has figured it out. But it hasn't. That's dangerous. And we spend all our time actually trying to avoid this dangerous situation. So, you know, some people have suffered through my course, and they, and they know that it is, is a very hard thing to avoid. Okay. Um, so let's assume that we have ways to prime machine learning systems so that at least when they solve the problem, when they have learned how to predict cancer from not cancer, we will know it. When they fail, we will know it and say, this problem is too hard for us. Still, things can go wrong. And now this will, this will, will sort of link up with things that can go wrong with human learning. And I'll just show two examples. So suppose, instead of trees, we're trying to learn elephants. Okay, and that's an elephant, for those of you who don't know. I grew up with them. OK. Is there an elephant in this picture? So many of us will have no problem okay, saying that there is an elephant in that picture. Is there an elephant in this picture? Also, yes. Okay, but they, these two things look completely different. Okay. Now, I'll tell you what's different. Here, you can imagine that you're in the 60s, and someone's in Africa, in Africa taping a a video of elephants and broadcasting it and blah, 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 and you're watching it in the US, it's coming and there's lots of garble and noise and this and that. So it's, this is a corrupted image of an elephant. Okay. Not every pixel has come through clean. Okay. But somehow, we are able to, to separate the true from the random noise, like these few little pixels. Here's the news story. It's very hard for computers to do that. Somehow, we are pre-wired to simplify. So this looks like a very complicated picture. Somehow, we are pre-wired to simplify and say, let's find the basic structure. Don't go and, now what a computer can do is it can go to this left pixel and say, oh, this picture has a pixel here. Let me find pic pictures that had pixels here. Okay, Because this picture has a pixel there. Okay, and then it'll you know, output all kinds of things. Clouds, trees, that's a cloud. Okay. Somehow that problem needs to be solved. So somehow we need to solve the problem of not, we need to restrain the system so that it, it's able to simplify and not be led astray by random noise, random fluctuations, things that, you know, corruption in the data. Okay. Now humans are not the best at it either. Humans do have a tendency to catch on to little things and go, go with it. Here's an example. Who here is afraid of Friday the 13th? Because you're all rational. Okay. But Friday the 13th is a valid myth, or whatever, what do they call it, a superstition. Okay, it's a superstition, why? Because people are afraid of Friday the 13th. Why? Because sometimes in history, Friday the 13th has been the day on which something bad happened. So we catch on to it. But it was just happened to be Friday the 13th, but we catch on to it. It's going through, as Bill said, we have a, 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 we have a primed system, and you know, we have the ability to sort, of, to, to sort of adapt very rapidly, even to single occurrences. Who here thinks that we are the guys who are always at the red light, right? We're always at the red light. It's a mathematically impossible fact. Because if it's red for you, it's green for someone else. If you average over people, everyone's at green and red roughly the same amount. Okay? So, so we also, just like machines, can get led astray by random things. Okay? Here's a different situation. 
Here, okay, this is the picture of an elephant you'll see in a first or second grade picture book. Okay, why? Because if you show that picture, the second, the two-year-old, or the, I mean, sorry, not second or third grade, two-year-old or three-year-old picture book. If you show a two-year-old that, they'll start getting confused. They'll start thinking, oh, this grass is very important for the elephant, and look at those lines on the trunk, and blah, blah, blah. And if there's a little chip in the tusk, the chip in the tusk is very important. Okay? So what do we do? We simplify the task. Okay? We know that the two-year-old learning system is not quite as able to extract and simplify and so on on its own. So we'll simplify the problem for the two-year-old and say, this is an elephant. And miraculously, they will recognize that as an elephant. That's called generalizing from simple examples. So how to do that with machines, that's another big problem. Okay. And if, if we can sufficiently prime the system, just like we are primed to recognize trees, both the neural network itself and our history, if we can correctly prime machine learning systems, if we can, if we can in some sense teach them how to restrain themselves and simplify, and if we can provide them with appropriately simple examples for their capabilities, okay? So the, the complexity of the examples should not be according to the complexity of the problem. Because figuring out what an elephant is is a very complex problem. We present the data that's of the appropriate complexity to the machine, just like we present simplified data to the two-year-old. If we can do all this, then we are in this world, and in fact, a much more advanced world than this. <clears throat> okay, so I'll just end with a quick summary. It turns out that when you sit down and write down all the theory of machine learning systems. They, are very, they mimic, to a large extent, the theory, or at least what we think is the theory, or what we might believe is the theory behind human, le behind human learning. Okay. You have to pre-wire. So it, it's a mistake to set out with a machine and say, I'm going to create the machine that can learn anything. It just doesn't exist. You have to pre-wire a machine learning system so that it can learn particular tasks. But the good thing with machines is that unlike humans, which are pre-wired from birth and we cannot change that, we can develop different machine learning systems. The Google guy who wants to, do, who wants to learn from data how to advertise. The cancer guy who wants to distinguish cancerous from non-cancerous. So they have to be primed. Okay? They have to be restrained so that they don't go off on tangents. Now, tangents are inevitable because data comes with lots of corruptions and lots of irrelevant little details. And if the machine focuses on those details, it's going to end up with nonsense. They have to be presented with the appropriate level of complexity data that is in accordance with how they were primed. Okay. And ideally, more data is better. Okay, when you do all that, okay, and if you were trying to distill machine learning into, um, into sort of uh, uh, a phrase, which I'll give you at the end, you find out that machines learn best when they're challenged. Okay. So they're, you've primed them, and you give them a task for which they, 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 the, the, the task is slightly more difficult than what they can actually solve. But then they should not be too challenged. So there should not be too much noise in the data. There should not be too many complex examples. Okay. Now, this is, an, this, is, this, is a, this is a task that I sort of do when I teach my class. But it's a very e effective way to get a handle on machine learning. Okay. So think of this as your parting gift. <clears throat> you want to walk forwards. Okay. So that's your goal. That's the machine learning task. You want to walk forwards, like predict cancer from not cancer. Okay. And you have data. So in, in machine learning, you have data and you have a goal. Your goal is to walk forwards. Okay. The data is kind of like your past, what you've seen before, 
and now you, you've seen certain, certain pictures of trees and non-trees, and now moving forward in life, you want to determine which are trees and which are not trees so you can avoid the trees. So you want to walk forward, but you are only allowed to look backwards. Try and do that. That's machine learning from data. Walk forwards, looking backwards. If you figure out how to do that, you know how to do machine learning. 